Hello everyone, this is Brox Gags, and uh, in this video we're going to step our way through the design process with an example, uh, just to hopefully make things more concrete and uh, firm up the individual steps and what happens in each step um, a little bit better. And so in the lower half of the screen you'll see the uh, prompt for this example. Um, let's assume I've got a ATV and a flatbed pickup and I need to find a way to basically load it and unload it we'll say. Um, let's assume that I'm wanting to take a trip out uh, to the mountains in Colorado right around there with a four-wheeler and I need to find a way, some sort of solution to this loading and unloading process um, at the beginning and end of my journey to Colorado. And so that's a kind of a vague cloudy description of the problem, but we know that's not good enough. We need to uh, basically take that description and be able to formulate a list of design inputs that our solution is going to have to satisfy um, at the end of our process there. And so one of the things we may do to begin with is come up with some uh, characteristics of the ATV and the pickup that uh, gets a little bit more specific. So the things that may be of interest to us if we're trying to find a solution for this loading and unloading. And so to pick this up, I've got an example of an ATV here. Um, I just picked one at random. Uh, let's say it's this Kawasaki 2022 Brute Force 750 4x4i EPS camo. Um, I do not have this, nor do I know much about Kawasaki, but it'll work for the lecture here. And so I look at their web page and let's say well the price that really doesn't factor into anything I'll assume I've already owned it uh, if I get down here to model specs we may have found some items of interest and so if I start clicking and expanding these out um, under the power we see things like engine characteristics displacement maximum torque uh, some of these may be of interest but probably not too much and one thing I can think of is like the maximum torque uh, may come into play there as far as I'm gonna have to uh, build some sort of ramp and I want to make sure the ATV is able to have enough torque to propel itself up the ramp um, I'm assuming just by the fact that it's an ATV it probably would be able to do that so um, I'm not seeing too much here of interest uh, as far as capabilities here um, I've got some information about the front and rear, rear tires that may be of interest. Again, kind of thinking about if, hey, if I built a ramp, I would want to know the widths of those tires, for instance. Um, a ground clearance, that may be something as well that uh, may be of interest for us if we're trying to build some sort of mechanism to carry the ATV. Um, we've got a towing capacity, total rack capacity. Um, towing capacity that may be of interest. We could maybe make some assumption that if it can tow that much, I can also pull on the frame, but with that amount of force and not break anything structurally. Um, I've got a total rack capacity, 242 pounds. Uh, front and rear rack, that's probably it. Um, roughly distributed. Uh, one, one thing I'm thinking about when I see those total rack capacity, we haven't got to the IDA stage, but I'm thinking, okay, where is that going to be of interest to me or not? Um, what if I tried to pick this thing up in some way, like buy the rack itself? Of course, I would want to make sure that I didn't pull the rack right off of the uh, frame of the four-wheeler. And so that would possibly be of interest. So my as I walk through this, I'm basically taking the time and I'd like jot these things down. As far as, hey, um, here's a detail associated with the four-wheeler. Uh, if I come down to the, the details section here as well, um, frame type, um, if it got more specific about the steel or if I made some assumptions about the steel, I may be able to use that. Oh, this would be a good one here, the front and rear track width, uh, so the uh, transverse distance between the wheels there. Um, that would definitely be of interest. I'd want to take note of that. Oh, I like these bounding box dimensions as well. Um, just make, to make sure as far as if I had some sort of carriage that I would be carrying this thing with um, from the ground up to the um, flatbed plane, um, I would need to know that. Um, well, I'd probably grab the seat height just in case. Um, this curb weight would definitely be of interest here. Um, I'm at some point going to have to lift or get this thing up a certain amount, so it would be nice to know how much it weighs, 700 pounds. Wheelbase, again, would be something I'd be interested in. That distance, uh, kind of in the longitudinal direction, the front to back direction of the two wheels uh, would be definitely be something as well. Uh, instruments, probably nothing. Color, nah. Uh, warranty, probably not as well there. Uh, so, it gives you an, a little bit of perspective from the ATV. Uh, now, before we go on, we'd be interested also in the pickup as well, right? I'm going to set this thing on the pickup, so I might need to know, like, this vertical distance from the ground to the plane of the pickup would be something I'd be interested in. 
Um, maybe as well the width of that bed as well um, would be things I would want to know if there's any mounting points that are very convenient as well. And so what we're doing is basically building up this list of details associated with um, our design inputs. And so things we may end up having to say are things like, well, the whatever implement we have or whatever solution we have must be able to lift this 700 pounds you saw in the uh, Kawasaki inputs. We may say, hey, we're, we'll allow for a rider to be on there. So um, let's say it's a 300 pound rider there. So let's just say it's a thousand pounds we're going to have to lift there. And so whatever solution we have is going to have to basically take this a thousand pound load uh, from the plane that it's sitting at on the ground up to the plane uh, where it can get on top of the pickup itself there. Other things we might say in here is, well, that time that it takes to lift, how long are we going to allow that? Is that lift need to happen within seconds or within minutes or within hours? Um, probably not hours. That's quite a long time. Probably not seconds, right? That's, that's awfully quick. Uh, but maybe in a reasonable amount of time, um, a few minutes would probably be um, a good estimation as far as a, a reasonable um, duration for that lifting process there. And so I've got a few details here that I would then formulate into very specific uh design inputs uh, to the problem itself and then that would give me something to then uh, be able to judge myself at at the end of the day. Um, also just to throw a couple others out there as I'm thinking about it before we leave, um, I'm talking about going on a trip. Let's say I'm funding this also by myself so uh, time and money would be things in here, right? I might have a um, budget for this design implementation there and so maybe if I'm funding it itself and maybe I say well I, I don't want to spend more than five hundred dollars or maybe it's a thousand dollars there um, in terms of materials as well as any sort of tooling that I would have to build or have to buy in order to do this uh, as well as time uh, maybe I'm trying to plan to uh, see the mountains when the trees are turning color or something like that before it snows and so I'm sitting here thinking well that may be two or three months away so I may have less than a hundred days from the time that I'm defining the problem now to the time that I have to actually have a physical prototype ready to to roll um, with and so those are the other constraints we'd impose on this problem and so after we leave the identify the problem stage we now need to step into number two in terms of the steps and that's ideate and so now we get this long list of design inputs, now we want to try to come up with as many ideas as far as possible solutions we can have here. And again, these can be very informal. This could be stuff that, hey, I start the ID8 stage on a Monday. I know by Friday we're going to be done. We're going to start refining those uh, this list of ideas. So maybe I just carry a, a small notebook around with me for most of the week there. And anytime something sparks my idea, I jot it down in the notebook. And so let's say I've done that. And so I come up with some sketches of some example problems here. Uh, maybe I brainstormed with the, the group as well with this. And so just walking through some of the, the examples I can come up with, um, probably one of the more natural ones, just, hey, let's build some sort of ramp, right? I can set it on the ground and I can set the other end at the plane of the flatbed. And then I can just drive the ATV um, onto the flatbed itself. Um, when we talk about ramps, well, we could do this a number of different ways, right? I can have like a solid beam type ramp, maybe an I-beam or maybe some sort of laminated floor uh, type truss type uh, floor joist if you will um, could also be used maybe I've got somebody in the construction business and they've got some leftover stuff that they're um, selling after a job but just as scrapped essentially and I could harvest some of that um, or maybe I'm interested in hey let's make this fairly lightweight so maybe I look at some sort of truss design uh, there's a little more labor there obviously but um, would also work uh, maybe I say well let's take a step back it would be ideal if I didn't have to actually make anything um, what if I had some sort of trench or some sort of ditch or just some sort of area where uh, there was a hill and I could uh, basically make it to where I could back up the truck to it, uh, drive the ATV again on it, and then I'd be ready to go. And then I guess if I'm also driving to Colorado, I'd want to find a similar place at wherever I'm going there, right? That would be ideal. It'd be very cost effective, assuming I didn't have to dig out the, the ditch, so to speak. Other things, um, think of cranes, right? Um, think of there at the docks where you've got all the container ships coming in and off. Maybe that's what you see on the news. And you say, hey, that would be a good idea. Um, another thing that I've got in here is a, a link uh, to a, a YouTube video where they're actually talking about concrete uh, batteries. And so basically the idea of storing energy electrical um, or excess electrical energy like from solar um, by basically lifting up 
big heavy blocks of concrete um, during times where I have excess energy and then when I need energy I can just take those uh, blocks and have the crane lower them down and just the weight of the lowering it being able to harvest that energy change that gravitational potential energy then back to um, electrical energy there and saying hey that'd be really cool if I could do something like that maybe it's a little extreme but hey at this point we're just creating ideas right you're not supposed to be judging with the uh, feasibility of each one Another one that's also an example as well, if I had enough balloons, maybe you're at your uh, niece's birthday party and they've got a bunch of balloons, you're saying, well, if I had enough of those, um, I could potentially lift the ATV with them, right? Um, maybe don't think of the, the small helium balloons that you see at birthday parties, but maybe like big old weather balloons or something like that, or maybe even hot air balloons, so to speak, come to come to mind as well there. Um, and you would just tie a bunch of them to the ATV, it would eventually raise the ATV if I got enough of them. Maybe I take my pellet gun and just fire and shoot a few of them uh, to lower it back down. And that would be one way to raise it and lower it, um, depending on where I'm at. The example here with the hyperlink is a link to a event around 1982. This guy named Larry Wanderers basically um, had a bunch of balloons. He fastened them to a lawn chair and actually did get airborne um, for a considerable amount of time. Uh, the next one is a scissor lift type of idea. And so maybe I'm thinking, well, I'm, I was looking around at like the Jennies and those other lifts they use for construction work saying, hey, maybe if I made some sort of scissor lift, um, I could attach it to the side of the flatbed pickup, uh, make it very easily to attach and detach. And then I could just drive it onto some sort of carriage. It would then lift up, uh, maybe using the pneumatic or hydraulics. And then we'd slide it onto the flatbed plane and away we go. Uh, kind of piggybacking that idea as well. Maybe I go away from kind of the scissor type of geometry, but just have uh, fluid powered cylinders. Maybe I just have big hydraulic cylinders that raise and lower the uh, ATV onto the flatbed pickup. Then we think, well, what, what if I didn't want to mess with some um, tanks of fluid, like hydraulic fluid, I have to carry that around. And so maybe I say, well, I wonder if I could achieve the same thing, um, except using a, some sort of like rack and pinion or ball screw type mechanism there and have electric motors uh, running it as well there. And so th this type of kind of piggybacking where I'm saying, hey, I had one idea with a scissor lift and I'm stealing it a little bit, kind of morphing it, mutating it, if you will, and moving to a fluid power system and saying, well, I want to maybe have the same thing except for change the mechanism a little bit and maybe make it a screw mechanism. Um, that's all very much encouraged uh, during this ID8 stage here. And so at this point we'll say, well, I've got a, a, a few different options here to pick from and let's move forward and say, okay, I, I'm done creating my set of ideas. Um, that's all good. We've fulfilled the ID8 stage and now we need to then start the refinement step. And so the, the problem is, Let's say I look at this, I've got one, kind of one A, so let's call it two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different ideas. Um, again, I'm thinking about, I've got a project that, um, in my example, I may have 100 days before I go leave. I don't have the time, if I'm the only one running this, uh, to fully investigate all nine of these uh, different possible routes to a solution there. And so um, I then say, okay, well, I need to whittle this down. I need to come up with a few practical ones here. And so I might say things like, well, this hot air balloon, that sounds nice, but I don't want to have to go buy a bunch of balloons all the time, manage helium, whatever it may be there. Uh, so we'll knock this one out. Uh, the dig trench idea says, well, that may be innovative, but um, I can't guarantee where I'm always going to be driving to is going to have a nice place to um, back the ATV off. So I'm going to knock that one off as well. Fluid powered cylinders, we say, well, I don't want to mess with hydraulic fluids and hydraulic lines and heaven forbid there's actual a leak in there. Um, I'm going to knock that one out as well. And so we would start picking apart these uh, different ideas and seeing which are the strongest ones for a solution. And so for this example, let's say we end up with uh, picking the ramp here and the crane example here and say, okay, we're going to move with those and take them to the next step here. And so as we refine them, we may say things like, well, what are the materials here? And we'll start to firm up some of the geometry. So if I'm doing a truss thing, I might sketch out and say, well, uh, this is the type of, st of truss structure, like the underlying uh, geometry of those different members. Uh, the crane type things, we may start start narrowing it in and say, well, um, I'm going to use an electric motor when I, I go to do the actual pulling of the ATV upward. 
and just use some uh, mechanical advantages there to make sure it has enough torque to actually uh, move the ATV um, vertically. And so we would do that type of thing in the refinement stage, just get a little bit closer uh, to a detail design there. And so then after refinement, after we picked, say, the, the ramp examples and the crane examples, uh, then we would then move into the analyze stage. And this is where we would get very detailed. We would need to uh, start doing some structural um, analysis on both these, right? I'm moving this physical weight. We talked about it being 700 pounds, I think, with a curb weight, possibly a rider in here on the ramp. So we're talking about a 1,000 pounds worth of um, mass here that I'm needing to move. Let's say it's at least two and a half, three feet, uh, four feet vertically up to the flatbed height there. So uh, there is going to be some structural work that needs to be done there as far as analyzing that. And so uh, to give you an idea of how kind of solid works, kind of bring it back to the, the course a little bit, uh, could enter into this. Um, I've got a SolidWorks model here of a, a possible truss style ramp. And you can imagine I would set it in such a way, let's go to the front view, or this is the plane of the ground, this is the uh, plane of the flatbed, my flatbed's over here, and I would drive the ATV up this ramp onto the flatbed itself here. And so at this point, since it's in SolidWorks, I've actually defined a material, some sort of alloy steel. Um, I've actually captured the geometry of the different members as far as where they're going, but I've also captured the cross-section of these members as well. And so then I might say, okay, I need to start simulating what that load's going to be like on this ramp. And so we can do that in SolidWorks as well. Um, it has an FEA package, which is what you can see here. Um, it's got all these little purple nodes which are basically capturing oops, the intersections of all these different bodies and then you can also see these little green icons as well uh, these where I'm mimicking the constraints um, on this side you can see there's green icons at this joint this joint this joint and just joint that's basically saying hey that's where it's sitting down on the ground and we're fixing it there and then I've got two up here and let's say that's where it's resting or being held in place um, on the backside of my flatbed pickup. Um, then you'll also see these downward purple arrows here and that's going to be describing the load of the ATV and the rider uh, downward on the um, ramp itself here. You can see the magnitude is 250 per item and so that's one two three four items that's the thousand pounds we talked about here. Um, we would run the analysis and then we'd start looking at things such as this stress block and so um, we need to talk about a little bit about more about what these stresses are, what they mean. Um, but this stress here, the map for maximum axle and bending, is showing roughly 2,300 psi. You can see a note down here: this yield strength that's connected back to the material is roughly 90 ksi, 90,000 psi. <laughs> so we've got a fairly large factor of safety here uh, that we're dealing with. So um, we talked about in the design process how we might want to optimize the design, right? And so we might be saying, wow, um, this is overkill. This is way too heavy of a ramp. It could hold a lot more than what we're asking for it. And so one thing we may do is we may remove some of these members or we may cut down on the cross section, right? If I Maybe I go with a smaller tube diameter and a smaller wall effect in this and start working there. Um, there are some trade-offs there because, for instance, if this is welded, welding and I start shrinking the um, wall thickness too small, I may end up causing uh, some issues on the manufacturing side of things. Uh, me particularly, I'm not the best welder in the world, so if I, I shrink that uh, wall thickness too small, I'm going to have trouble not burning through the walls um, when I would go to weld such a thing. And so uh, that's one of those examples of a place in the design side of things where uh, there's going to be trade-offs, kind of competing agendas, if you will. From the stress analysis side of things, we might be saying, hey, I want to shrink this uh, wall thickness down uh, smaller and smaller uh, because I know the material is able to handle the load. But on the manufacturing side, it might say, well, hang on. At some point, we're going to have issues actually fabricating it as well. Um, let's just check out the displacement plot while we're here. Uh, as far as the deformation scale is one, uh, these Uries, that's the um, resultant displacement here. And so if I look at it from this, uh, I keep going to the wrong view, excuse me. Uh, from the side here, you can see the max displacement happens right here in the middle. We can expect that uh, just from how it's loading, kind of visualize how it would deform. And you can see the value here. This is a units of inches. Uh, that is 6.8 
thousandths of an inch, uh, so 0 0.0068. Um, that's something you wouldn't be able to feel. You wouldn't be able to hardly notice at all. Definitely if you were standing next to this thing, um, it wouldn't even look like it deformed there uh, relative to everything else around it there. Uh, so what we've got at this point is a very stiff and very um, strong design at this point relative to the load. And so, again, we may try to optimize this a little bit and save us some money um, with the tube cost, if you will, if I was continuing on with it. Uh, so that, that gives you an example from the ramp side of things. Um, we would do a similar thing with the, the crane idea. And so with the crane idea, one of the things we talked about was that rack capacity as far as on this ATV, could I consistently like put hooks on this rack and pull it up by the rack? Um, I'm thinking probably not, um, just by consideration of the fact that if this was 700 pounds curb weight, um, I think the maximum rack capacity is really in the low 200 pounds. And so I, I would fear that I would basically be pulling those racks right off of the ATV before it actually got off the ground at that point. And so we say, well, I've got to then put something underneath it, right, and pull it upward. And so maybe I come up with this little cradle design here. And so then I would drive the ATV up onto the cradle and then use these mounting elements here in order to actually attach wire cabling or whatever it is uh, to then lift it up and then maybe I set this entire cradle on the back of the flatbed pickup and then the ATV just rides on inside of the cradle all the way to our destination there. So again at the detailed design stage you should be able to answer things like well this member here is going to be made of a certain cross section here and it's going to be of a certain material same thing with all the other members um you'd also be able to say things like hey this thing's welded together uh, this is kind of kind of the weld rod we're going to be using um is it going to be all the way around or not what are the bead sides is going to be all that type of detailed information uh, would play into uh, the design side of things as far as in this analyzed stage itself and so hopefully you're getting the idea as far as what all is going to be involved at this stage. Um, we talked about system costs. Also, one thing to note is looking at commercially available options. Um, one of the things we might be looking at is, hey, is there something that I can buy off the shelf that'll satisfy my needs? Because a lot of times, if I can buy something off the shelf, um, it'll be cheaper uh, than what it would take for me to actually develop it on my own. Uh, there's, of course, um, obviously, um, places where that does not take into effect, especially if you have a very niche thing. Um, but sometimes you can get away with that. And so an example of one thing I might do is look up McMastercar here. They've got some uh, hand winch cranes and pallet lifters uh, just to kind of get a feel of is there anything here that I can mount to the back of my flatbed pickup, have the arm extend over the side of it, pick it up, and then be able to rotate it back, put it on the flatbed. Um, I could think if I actually had something like that, maybe I use it for other uh, tasks as well. Um, and so it'd be something to, to look at, especially if I start looking at these costs uh, here, depending on which one it is, you can go from, uh, it looks like $1,300 to several thousand dollars. So I'd always be weighing that in the back of my mind, as well, back of my mind saying, well, if I end up making a, if the commercially available one is say $6,000, but then if I have to build my own, it's $20,000, well, that $6,000 one off the shelf may be a better way to go. Okay, so I get down with the analyze stage. I've done all of my due diligence um, with all of the work detailing the designs from the crane and the two ramp um, variations there. Uh, then it would, step five would be I've got to make a decision. Um, I can't go through and allocate resources to develop all of those. I, I got to make a decision on one of them there. And so uh, this again is where I need to justify why I'm making the decision and what elements I like. And so maybe I say, well, I like the crane idea, but I think it's going to be more complex. I don't have a great way to mount it uh, to the cab or mount it to the flatbed itself. Uh, so we'll throw that one out. Uh, the ramps, I think the ramp that's a single member, like I talked about kind of like harvesting like a floor joist or something like that may uh, end up being too heavy, too bulky. And so I'm thinking I'm going to throw that out. So even though it's going to require a little bit more labor because uh, all the different members, I'm going to make the truss example uh, just because I think it may be a lighter. I don't, I don't think it may be. At this point in the analyze stage, you would know. You'd say things like, well, the truss member is going to take a little more labor, but it's going to be this much lighter uh, than the regular planar beam here. And so uh, I'm, I'm very 
uh, intrigued by that idea, just partly because then maybe I can manhandle these ramp or manhandle these um, truss ramps into place. Whereas before I couldn't do it by myself. I'd have to go uh, call my brother brother-in-law and say something like, hey, can you come help me uh, put these in place uh, so that I can drive the ATV on? Maybe it would be so heavy, but now it, instead of being a two-man operation, it'll be a one-man operation, and that drives uh, my decision the most there. And so for this example, let's say, hey, we decide on the truss uh, style of ramp, and then the next thing would be implement. And so maybe I waited till the implement stage to actually finish, finalize all my detail uh, drawings associated with those individual members. Uh, if I was doing it in SOLIDWORKS, I'd make a cut list, uh, which goes pretty quickly, but then I'm just polishing up all the notes there. Um, in this case, it's a, it would be a project for myself there, so I probably wouldn't need to make field type documentation, or have to worry any, about anything about that. Um, and so that would be kind of more if I was going to productionize it. Uh, at that point, maybe it works really well. And then I'm saying, hey, maybe I really have something here. Uh, maybe I want to try to make a business selling these things. And so and then I have to work about building marketing uh, materials and all that stuff. And all that would fall into the, the implementation side of things. And so there you have it. We've walked ourselves through uh, the six stages of the design process. Um, just to kind of recap here, um, we started with a very kind of vague idea of a problem saying, hey, I've got this ATV, um, I need to get it from the ground on top of the flatbed pickup and vice versa. Uh, there, we translated that into a list of design inputs during the identify problem stage. From that, we then went to the idea stage, uh, came up with these examples of possible paths to a solution. From that, we went to the refinement stage where we went through this big list and whittled it down to a handful of options that we could then pursue in the analysis stage. In this example, we grabbed the ramp and the crane examples. In the analysis stage, we applied all those uh, very interesting topics in the engineering and physics world, such as uh, dynamics, statics, mechanics, materials, fluid mechanics, the, all that type of stuff uh, to really evaluate the design, try to figure out how it's going to react to um, the loads we're going to um, impose on it in the field. We'd be looking at costing here. We'd be looking also have an idea toward manufacturing times. All of that would all play into the design or the, excuse me, the anal analyze stage there. Uh, then finally, we go, leave the anal analysis stage and we go to the design side of the design step. And then we say things like, well, I evaluate all the options and we pick, in this case, we picked one option that we're going to move forward with. And then finally, we'd go to the implementation stage where we're uh, polishing up all those fine details, finalizing bonds, finalizing the detailed drawings, and then actually going into production. And so again, I hope this helps you uh, get your mind around the uh, design process, get an idea of the flow of how things move from step to step and what's going on in each step. And as always, thanks for watching the video.